begin. Uh, welcome, everybody. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. Today, we have a special event. We have an interactive exercise, a scenario, and we're looking forward to this very much. It's going to be very challenging and very interesting. Obviously, a lot of people in the United States, a lot of people in American higher education, and quite a few people around the world are paying a great deal of attention to the American election that's coming up in a few weeks. A lot's at stake in that election. Um, there are all kinds of possibilities for national and global transformation. There's also a great deal at stake about higher education and what this would mean for the policies around higher education, as well as the culture around it and state politics, not to mention research and science. So we decided that we would have an interactive scenario here uh, in order to explore this. That is, for the next hour, we're going to posit a scenario for how the educate how the election might turn out. We're going to describe this in some detail. In fact, let me just give you a little outline. The first thing we're going to do is take you through about a week after the election and sketch out how it might unfold. Uh, and then we'll give you a chance to explore that outcome and then to explore, more importantly for us and for our purposes, how you would respond to it and how you would react to it. This is a focus on higher education. Each of you will react in the role you have now. So as a professor, as a technologist, a librarian, a president, a dean, a student, or the role that you'd like to have in the near future. You know, if you're applying for a job to be a chancellor or something, think of yourself in that role. And we'll do that collaboratively. We'll use all these technologies. I'll bring you some of you on stage. Some of you will post in the Q&A boxes. Some of you will post in the chat box. But we'll collaboratively grapple with this. And then about half past the hour, we're going to advance the scenario. And I'll show you how that works. And then we're going to do this again. How do you respond? How do you understand this? How do you react? In the last few minutes, we'll try and sum up thinking about what did you learn from all of this and what you take away. Uh, just a, a couple of uh, quick notes here. Uh, again, for you to play your current role. So think about yourself and, and your position. Uh, what does it mean to be the head of a teaching and learning center in the end and as an election outcome occurs? What does it mean to be a graduate student and how do you respond? So think not just of yourself as a citizen or a resident or just as a human being, but think of yourself in that role. Second, try and balance some of the practical effects with some of the future visions of this. So think about everything from what might this mean to a grant proposal, for example, to what does this mean for the very purpose of higher education? So don't be afraid to think very practically and in detail, but also to think big. And above all, collaborate with each other. Please ask questions. Please share your thoughts. Uh, and you can use the chat box. You can see people in the chat are very friendly. Uh, and you can also uh, share just out loud and talking with each other. This is a collaborative exercise. I'm not going to tell you what happens. We're going to work on this together. Does that make sense? Any questions about the process before we launch? Lisa, I did call you friendly. I really did. It shows you what little I know. Yes. Uh, Tom and uh, Chris, I did not bring one of my cats. I'm actually on campus, and I really just couldn't convince the cats to come with me this time. Lisa, that's a great shirt. I really like that. If you could, uh, if you could share with me the storefront where that is, I would, I would love to get that. Uh, that'd be a good present for some people. Uh, Tom's asking a question. Tom, that's a question we're going to ask. Start answering in just a few minutes. Hang on a second. Yes, Matthew, I can indeed do that. I'm close enough to call your mother. And hello, Daita. Very, very good to see you. Please, please, please bring up climate issues if we haven't, if we don't do that yet. All right. Now, uh, one word of content warning, just for you to buckle your seatbelts. This might be a bumpy ride. So here is the position. We're going to assume that this is the outcome of the national election. And November 7th, 2024, we're able to pretty clearly get a sense of where things have turned. That uh, Donald Trump has eked out uh, a pretty substantial victory in the Electoral College. You can see here from this map that some of the decisive states that he wins 
are Pennsylvania and Michigan, uh, not to mention, of course, Ohio and Georgia, as well as the traditional red states. Now, let me break this down to some details. Uh, we have uh, on the very first day of the election, just a few hours after its start, Trump declared victory, so that he was clearly winning, made up some numbers, said that he was doing great. Uh, Kamala Harris did not concede. Uh, it took her a week to do this because we had a whole series of debates, struggles, uh, physical struggles, lawsuits around in individual states and their vote counting. But at this point, she has conceded. It looks like Donald Trump has won the presidency. Along with him, the Republicans have won majorities in both the House and Senate as they did in 2016. These are slim majorities, but nevertheless, numerical majorities. In some states, notably Georgia and uh, Arizona, there's a lot of chaos and uncertainty among the state electoral processes, competing slates of electors, lawsuits, people resigning and fights, but the outcome is pretty clear. Now, to take this a little further, uh, I'd like to bring on stage my friend and colleague and future transform favorite, uh, Tom Hames. Uh, because Tom is, after all, a president of government, and he knows a great deal about this. And I'd like him just to expound a little bit more on the implications of this victory and how it might play out. Tom? So, uh, I'm not a president. I'm a, a professor of government from time to time. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. I promoted nice, you mentally. There's a nice Freudian slip. I like it. You're a president for me. <laughs> so... Um, <clears throat> I mean, at this point, if if that's the situation, I mean, it's kind of a done deal. Uh, you know, usually once you get to that that level of and again, I don't know the vote margins in the individual states based on your scenario. So um, I think the more interesting scenarios come out, come out when there are you know, when it when it comes down to uh, that tipping point state being uh, contested in some way, voting, you know, votes in or out or whatever. Um, so that part of the scenario you really don't 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 get into too much but um uh at this point um yeah i mean i don't i'm not sure what you want me to say other than let you know buckle up it's going to be a bumpy ride well you, you uh, actually in some ways it would be a less bumpy it's a less bumpy ride than if the the alternative had happened well let's 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 press on that a little bit but uh one thing you did you pointed out and I, i'm not sure if this was clear in the chart i'm using the website uh, 271 to win, yeah. which lets you create uh, nice maps like this. Uh, Correct. You yeah, can see, I've, I've used it. Uh, so you can see everybody from the, the colors that the hard colors at the dark blue, the dark yeah. red, are where the outcome mm -hmm. is pretty decisive, like 60% for one candidate. But where it's light pink and where it's light blue, right. that's where it's much closer. Uh, so here we're presuming razor thin margins in some of these states, uh, including again Michigan, right. Pennsylvania, much like 2016 and, and 2020. But but a razor quote unquote razor thin margin uh, uh, of 51.49 is not the same as a razor thin margin of like uh, uh, Shelby mentioned in Florida in, in 2000. You know, um, mm -hmm. given the voting systems that were in place in Florida in 2000, the error rate on them, um, I, I was, you know, people like, oh, Al Gore really won that election or, or you know, or George Bush really won that election. The answer is we, we will never know who won Florida in 2000. It is statistically impossible because of the of the you know, it, you can't read the intentions of the voters in, 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 in ballots. And there were a lot of mistakes that were made along the way that may have led to that result. But in terms of the actual vote count. Good There's point. no way, you know, the, the error rate for 537 votes uh, is, uh, yeah, that's that's statistical noise at that point. So if we're talking about these states being razor thin, if we're talking about, you know, and the margin, say, in Georgia, which was, uh, what was it, 12,000 votes in 2020, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, is not anywhere as close as that. I think that was significant. And the other thing is the voting systems have become more accurate. Uh, we're yes. not using, no one's using punch cards anymore. Uh, and punch cards are 1960s technology or 19. Well, <laughs> they go all the way back to the loom if you really right. want to <laughs> want to go there. But um, no, in, uh, in, the, in this in this yeah. case, the oh. uh, in this case, the um, there is some litigation going on um, over some of the different outcomes. But uh, right. the Harris campaign does not endorse those. Um, so again, yeah. much like in 2000 when the Gore campaign conceded, that's the you know the that effectively ends the contest. 
Uh, just to go a little further, um, uh, we've had protests across the nation. Uh, so some of the protests have been just stark. Um, we can't stand this. Uh, some of them have been in support of President, uh, soon to be President Trump. Some of them have been anchored around a cause, such as a climate change protest. Some of them have been uh, organized around identities. So we have women protest, again, like the um, uh, mm -hmm. Pussy Hat March in uh, 2017. Uh, we're also seeing more court cases uh, that are filed. Some of them proceed, some of them are shut down as different uh, state party activists uh, accuse each other of lying or hiding uh, ballots and so on. Uh, we're also seeing some high profile celebrities uh, in the United States declaring themselves to be out of the country. Uh, so some actors, for example, some sports figures, um, some uh, influencers have decided they will now migrate to Canada or to Costa Rica. Quick question. And I know you may or not may not have gained uh, gained this out, but did Harris win the popular vote nationally? No, she did not. Okay, no. okay. So that 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 changes the conversation slightly. You know, mm -hmm. again, one of the problems with our system is it is skewed um, yeah. in certain ways. And don't forget, no Republican has won the popular vote uh, since two thousand four. And if you exclude two thousand four, it goes all the way back to nineteen eighty eight. Mm -hmm. So but it doesn't the game is played by the Electoral College. I understand that. I'm just saying that uh, from a perspective of grievance. Yep. yep. The fact that, you know, it's this was a problem back in 2016, 2017 yep. is that, you know, Hillary won. Was it three million more votes than Trump? So there is still lost the election. Right. So there um, and and discussions over that often end in futility. And in this case, um, right. there are questions of, well, how did we lose the vote? Um, and uh, this has led to a lot of unrest. I just want to unfold that a bit more. Um, one of them is that uh, uh, MAGA groups are fighting Democratic protesters in different cities, starting with Portland, Oregon, as well as Washington, D.C. And a lot of the fighting is simply you know, people beating each other with sticks and with shields. Uh, some of the escalates to tasers or to pepper spray. There have been individual shootings and a couple of mass shootings. Uh, the mass shootings, it's hard to tell if they were political or if they were just targets of opportunity. Some of the individual shootings include uh, shooting uh, leading pol uh, political figures as well as activists. Several Trump buildings, including one in New York City, have been damaged by explosives and by paint. Uh, two more um, attempts to kill Donald Trump um, have been described and were foiled. Um, it's an open case to what extent they were serious plots, but they are nevertheless there. Um, in a popular level, I don't mean popular as everyone doing it, I mean not an official level, there are a lot more threats and violence against immigrants, um, like what we've seen in Springfield, Ohio. So across the nation, unrest is continuing to spread. Tom, did you want to add anything about that? Well, I will say that statistically speaking, left-wing violence is largely a fiction um, in this country. So uh, the vast majority of domestic terrorism events have been perpetrated by right wing violence. So I think that's a little bit of a stretch as far as, you know, Antifa is, is largely a, a right wing um, fantasy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are people who identify themselves as that. But in terms of any sort of organized or even cellular structure that would characterize a, a terrorist organization or, or, you know, whatever you want to call that. Um, are is largely absent from that side of things so um it's possible false flag and things like that you know the comments that recently trump was making about uh certain people being enemies of the state and therefore should be rounded up and so on and so forth is uh could motivate some people to do some things especially some local sheriffs for instance who are mm -hmm. uh, itching to uh, show their bona fides and things like that but the idea of of left-wing violence it, you know, it's a little bit like atheist terrorists. You just don't see it. So, yes. So a lot of this is um, uh, brawls between um, activists yeah. on both sides, um, and uh, and some are very very upset um, uh, and are willing to act out. Um, but as you say, we don't have organized left wing uh, terrorism here. Quite true. Yeah. Uh, in the chat, uh, Will Emerson asks a really good question: uh, How does the U.S. military react to this scenario? Uh, so far in uh, in my model, Tom, uh, I have it that this is that all the unrest is mostly the province of local and state police. Um, mm. I'm going to proceed a little further along those lines right now, but the U.S. military has no official role. Does that 
seem constitutionally sound? Well, yeah, it's absolutely constant. I mean, we have posse comitatus, and you can't mm -hmm. just sort of deploy the military in 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 the United States. Um, and there there've been some exceptions to that, but for the most part, that's been a pretty hard. You know, honestly, if you look at the statements, for instance, of General Milley in the in mm -hmm. the recent Woodward book, for instance, just just to cite one example, the military in the United States has a fortunately for this country a culture in as they see themselves as defenders of democracy. First and foremost, certainly the U.S. Army, the professional military. Um, one thing that you see in other countries, we, I don't, we haven't really seen it here, but less um, disciplined, less organized, less military acculturated organizations like a National Guard kind of situation, or far, you know, or militias, <laughs> uh, don't necessarily have that same sort of thing. So I would, I would be more concerned about governors trying to use the National Guard in ways that were questionable than um, the 101st Airborne Division dropping into Portland. Hang on, hang on to that. Certainly while that. Biden's president, and that's the other thing, is he's commander in chief, he would not. Exactly, exactly. Um, uh, Matthew Henry asks, where does stipulation of the Patriot Act fall into the action in this scenario? Um, and right now, I don't see any need to evoke Patriot yet, uh, although Homeland Security is monitoring the situation. Yeah, I mean, again, you'd have to somehow figure out a way to. I mean, you'd have to invent a fiction of a of a of a left wing conspiracy or something like that in order to even get into those kinds of um, provisions that give the government more leeway under the Patriot Act. So I, I think it would be certainly once Trump is in office that could change. But in this transition period, don't forget we have Biden is still commander in chief. He controls exactly. all these assets. Exactly. And uh, Seth has uh, uh, Seth has mentioned um, how is the Biden administration reacting to this? And right now, Biden himself personally is calling for calm and for an orderly transition. Yes. Now, if we look into higher education and how this is reacting here um, in this sector, which, again, is the purpose of our program, uh, we're seeing a lot of students protesting and they're protesting face to face on their campuses. And they're also protesting online in all kinds of ways, you know, from posting anti-Trump memes to organizing marches uh, to, you know, trying to march to a local Republican event and so on. Uh, and most of this is peaceful, if a bit chaotic. Uh, we're also seeing clashes between campuses and the surrounding community. So think about, for example, where you have a very red or conservative Republican uh, county or state, and the campus is uh, a blue island or an oasis. Uh, where the students will act out and run into friction with locals there. Um, and also the reverse may happen, where you may have Republican activists who show up on the campus borders in order to crow about their victory and, again, meet some static. Uh, we're also seeing the uh, right-wing organization Turning Point, uh, which is declaring the support for the Trump victory, and it is publishing details about professors, staff, and students who they see as disloyal and uh, as disloyal to the new administration. Uh, we're also seeing a lot of pressure for universities and for associations to take sides, to declare opposition or fealty uh, to the Trump administration. Uh, now, that runs into the decisions of quite a few campuses over the past few months to not take such positions, but that pressure is there, especially from activists. Uh, we're seeing some backlash against Gaza encampments, especially in the state of Michigan, uh, where people charge uh, Gaza protesters with tipping the election, again, being very close. Uh, Gaza protesters being very unhappy with the uh, Biden-Harris administration and, according to the crit criticism, not giving enough support and thereby tipping the balance to Trump. Uh, we're also seeing state political leaders, uh, Republican state political leaders, uh, reacting to this by calling for all forms of campus discipline, asking presidents to crack down, asking presidents to call out local police, and uh, asking for their legislatures to come up with new laws in order to protect students uh, of different uh, political stripes. Uh, in the in the chat, uh, Michael Walker mentions the recent movie War Games, uh, which is a documentary about a scenario very similar to this. Uh, yes, Michael, I haven't been able to see a copy of the film yet. Uh, I followed it closely, and that's part of the inspiration. Uh, a bunch of us work in this field of simulations and gaming, and uh, and that's exactly the kind of thing that, that we'd like to see. Um, but so far, we don't have the military uh, breaking ranks on this. 
Uh, Lisa Durf asks, would people take refuge on the campus of higher education institutions? That's a fantastic observation, Lisa. Uh, you could imagine some people doing so. Uh, you know, imagine people who see themselves threatened by the new order, uh, people, for example, who are undocumented immigrants, people who are of some identity that they feel puts them extremely at exposure, such as a young woman or a person of color or a gay man, uh, and they may come to campus seeking sanctuary. That's an interesting challenge to see how a campus will respond to that. Uh, Shelby Rosengarten, um, uh, I'm very, very pleased to, uh, uh, to see Shelby here, uh, says it's a little different with state community colleges, not so much political activism. Commuter schools have different campus culture and different populations. Quite true. Uh, we've seen, we have seen from the past year that the uh, Gaza protests were restricted to the wealthiest and most elite institutions. So we should expect to see protests there as well as taking place in other state and private institutions. Uh, Roxanne says that students are probably uh, stressed and acting out violently due to Biden not having forgiven student debt. That's a really key point, Roxanne. We're gonna come back to that point. Um, but that's one where students have really seen, um, you know, uh, being very disappointed with, uh, with Biden. Uh, Daisy Nip raises a really good point. Uh, communication issues, defending and fighting for democracy and constitution does not mean defending the party or people in there. Similar to the arguments behind people talk about China against their government, etc. Uh, very, very true, Daisy. Thank you for mentioning that. I think in the, in the heat of this moment, those differences are going to be compressed a great deal. Uh, Shelby also adds that most community colleges aren't residential. There are some, true. Um, now, let's take this a little bit further. Uh, let me ask you all, um, first, what questions do you have about the scenario's details so far? Do you have any other questions you'd like to put forward? And then how do you respond in your role? So please say what your job is, what you do, instructional designer, dean, that kind of thing, and what you imagine you would be doing. So again, this is mid-November 2024, right after the election. The election has been decided. Things are pretty chaotic. Now, please use the chat box. I can definitely read what you have in the chat box, but also try the Q&A box because then I can take what you type and I can put it on the screen for everyone. Or you could just join us on stage. Uh, you can tell from Tom's presence that you do not have to have a beard in order to be on stage. <laughs> Uh, Chris, um, Chris asked a really good question. Has Trump promised to eliminate the Department of Education on day one? Yes, he has. And by the way, let me just point to a couple of resources. On the bottom left of the screen, you should see a couple of tan colored boxes. Uh, one of them says Agenda 47. One of them says Project 2025. Uh, Project 2025 is a link to our long discussion, exploration of the Heritage Foundation's manifesto for President Trump's uh, administration. It, Agenda, 20, Agenda 47 is way shorter, and that's the uh, Trump's official platform for the GOP. So we are drawing a lot of the work for this scenario on those two sources, among others. Uh, and yes, in both of those, Chris, as well as in numerous speeches, Trump has vowed to eliminate the Department of Education. Uh, Catherine Furlong says that any response we need to be filtered by university communications. We cannot go rogue here in a library and IT organization. Catherine, what a great, great, great response. First of all, thank you for identifying your organizations. So IT and library. Um, and then bringing up this classic problem. Um, I don't know if you saw uh, Kamala Harris on uh, Charlemagne the God a few days ago, but uh, Charlemagne asks her, why do you repeat yourself in some of these appearances? And she says, discipline, message discipline. And that's what a lot of campus leaders would like to see. However, we are not dictatorships and we have lots of autonomy and people who are very passionate and they break loose. So you will have librarians and technologists saying things in person as well as online. Um, so we should expect some attempts by campuses to grapple with that and perhaps respond to such uh, uh, issues. Uh, Stephanie P says, as a dual citizen living in the US, I'll begin exploring immigrating back to Canada and bring my own grown daughters and their families with me. I hear that, Stephanie. I hear that. If I can ask, uh, what, what is your academic position? Are you a professor or a dean or a student? Um, my own family has, has spoken of this. Uh, and Lisa mentions a really, really good point, um, as she usually does, that the borders may be closed. Um, 
we know that this year, Canada actually has massively cut the number of international students it accepts, which is a huge change for them. Uh, and they will probably greet the, the swarm of people coming over from the United States with some suspicion and want to restrict that in, in different ways. Uh, Stephanie is Director of Instructional Design. Thank you. Thank you. So we have instructional design, educational technology, IT, and library represented so far. Uh, Tom, uh, you're saying the president. You mean the uh, U.S. president or campus president? The U.S. president. Thank you. Uh, foreign, when I'm talking about foreign policy, I'm talking about the U.S. president. Well, I, I, just, I just want to make sure I'm, <laughs> I'm doing this in a hurry. Well, as yeah. opposed to a president thinking about the... Uh, well, I, there are a couple of people who are talking about leaving for Canada and other things like that. And I worry that, you know... Uh, that some of the some of the biggest damage that you're going to see is going to be in foreign policy because the president has fewer constraints there in the last administration he had quite a few people who were basically roadblocks uh who slowed things down and and kept some of the more egregious things from happening exactly. but this he's eliminated most of those people uh, hang, by hang, the end of the administration hang, so, hang on for a second, but that's, for a second. That's, that's a whole other conversation well no we're going to come up to that because right yeah. now in the simulation we're in november President Biden is still President Biden. So um, yeah. President-elect Trump is, is starting to, you know, the, the transition of putting, getting his team equipped, but he's not actually legally making deals, not yet, although he has, as we've seen, quite a few contacts. Um, uh, Adele- that didn't stop him uh, last time. <laughs> I said quite a few contacts. Adele uh, Dondano asks, can you share again what the status is of conflicts in Ukraine, Middle East, et cetera? Fantastic question. Uh, and right now we're assuming that the conflict in Ukraine is more or less the same as it was in uh, October. That is a grinding war of attrition with Russian advantage. Um, and we are assuming that the uh, Middle Eastern conflict has expanded significantly, but there is no, there is no use of nuclear weapons in either of those theaters. Um, there's a great deal of uncertainty, of course, not to mention a great immense amounts of human suffering, both, but neither of those have, have cracked wide open. Uh, some of the other possible flashpoints around the world, such as China and Taiwan, India and Pakistan, have not gone off yet. Uh, Stephanie points out a really, really important point, uh, and I just want to put this on the table uh, and ask all of you to think about this. She says that she works remotely so she can keep her job. So this is an interesting thing to think about. How many people would move across borders but still work at the same institution online? How many institutions would cut that back because of the the the, the lack of control that they have over the political messaging? And that's kind of a wild card. So think about, well, your state, Tom, uh, Texas or Shelby State, Florida. To pick two, uh, to, to, two reliable examples, would they allow this to happen? Uh, or would governors lean on especially public institutions to, to not do that? Well, I know some institutions, uh, some states require the faculty, even the ones of working remotely, to live within the borders of the state. And that's so, and you know, violating that, that's a clear rule breach. Um, in the in the chat, you've all hear, heard it here first. Uh, Philip Lingard says he'd be preparing to welcome U.S. faculty and students to Malta. So, <laughs> you know, Malta is a there's not enough room. Oh, it's a small well, place. <laughs> well, if the future transform gets first dibs, I'm, I'm glad to hear it. Um, now, Greg save Shuckman, us, yeah, save me a room, Philip. Uh, Greg Shuckman pointed out something that the simulation is going to be heavily influenced by the political leanings of participants. Quite true. Uh, nobody mm -hmm. here yet has celebrated. Um, wow, a Trump victory, awesome. Um, people are uniformly opposed to it. Uh, I've been trying to position this in a neutral way uh, as possible, trying to keep my own political leanings uh, out of this. Uh, but this is a good point, Greg, and this is one of the ways that simulations like this work, where they're constituted by participants. I hope everybody here feels free to express themselves uh, openly. Um, by the way, if if we get to save this and post this, I would love to share this chat. Um, if I, I'll, as usual, my, my usual practice, I'll anonymize it. But please, in the chat, let me know if you uh, if you don't want to do that. Uh, Shelby says. Uh, we focus on some media literacy in my classes that takes time to analyze and reflect on what we're reading and viewing. I imagine a fire hose onslaught would be hard to sift through. Not sure how to handle discussion in class if it gets uncivil. This is a really, really crucial point. Aren't how we already many, there? I think so, but I think this will really, really heighten it. I mean, imagine, Tom, uh, teaching a class on something that isn't election related, uh, photography, right, or a class mm. on French grammar the next day, and the students are like, I, I, I can't do this. I am, 
I want to talk about what happened at the polls, or I want to talk about why Harris conceded, uh, or the faculty can be the same way. Uh, or again, staff, you know, you're checking out books in the library, the person's like, oh, I can't believe this is happening. Um, with added to that, the fire hose, as Shelby puts it, of information, the constant stream of, of videos and memes and clips and stories. Um, you know, I, I position some of the details of the scenario in a kind of hedged way to allow for that, you know, that some of these aren't quite sifted out yet. Uh, that's a crucial point, crucial point, Shelby. Um, Philip will ask us to recommend uh, uh, experience of changes in Hungary and Turkey. Very, very useful ones to look at for that. Thank you, Philip. Thank you, Philip. Didn't like half the Central European University relocate to Vienna? Uh, it did, the entire one. Yeah, yeah, it did. That's a really good example. Uh, I mean, and the, in part because they, you know, they felt pressured, but also the pressure was real. Um, there was a lot of hostility from uh, Fidesz for that. Uh, Lisa reminds us to think about the difference between public and private institutions. Uh, so I give you one example. Uh, in 2016, November, after the election, uh, a group of students at a private college in Ohio uh, had a, a very uh, upset um, protest um, on the edge of campus, and this led into interactions with local uh, businesses, which ultimately led to lawsuits, which cost uh, or over then millions of dollars. Uh, Amber Stokes says, I've always heard progressives say they'll move to Canada, but recently I heard a Trump supporter say if Harris is president, they would go to Canada. That was a shift for me to hear. So either result could create an issue of Canadian border. Quite true, uh, Amber. <laughs> I, I would think about the states along those lines, especially uh, New York, uh, Washington, Vermont, New Hampshire, Maine, uh, Michigan. Uh, Matthew says moving away from America, financial means could be cut off or not allowed between the U.S. and other countries. Uh, good point. Good point. Um, and Chris adds that Southern New Hampshire University requires them to live in the U.S., so that's another boundary. Um, all right, I want to push this further a little bit further uh, forward because we have to we have to get this going. But I do want to share one last note from Charles Findlay. He says. I'd be fearful of the continued operation of large universities that are dependent on the enrollment of international students. I'd also be fearful of the safety of such students and the perceived desirability of becoming a student in the U.S. Very much so. That's coming right up. That's actually a good transition. How uh, has then, how has the international student population recovered in the last four years? Has uh, it much better? Yeah, uh, much better. Not quite. Uh, I mean, depending on the numbers. Uh, and we're going to actually have a forum session about this in a couple of months, um, mm -hmm. but it's uh, but it's better than under Trump. Um, but we may see a reprise of this. Now, what I'd like you to do is take this scenario forward a few months. So, advancing the clock for November 2024, I'd like to take you to late January, early February 2025. So, this is where the Trump administration becomes installed. The president is inaugurated. We have offices starting to be filled. Policy starting to be issued. And as you can tell from this image here, this is the amount of protests and unrest and chaos continue. So some of the actions that the Trump administrations begin with uh, are not surprising. Uh, a massive de deportation of undocumented immigrants begins uh, being conducted by multiple forces led by uh, ICE. Uh, he issues a series of executive orders on day one and then day two. Uh, one of them ends diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, programs and preferences and policies across federal offices to court. Uh, it ends all support for trans individuals, uh, including uh, the use of pronouns, and more importantly, the, uh, the support of medical and psychological support, uh, including for uh, transition, and also ends all climate programs, uh, all research, all grants, all efforts that are working on climate change. Furthermore, uh, opposition and protests continue. Uh, protests are now a fact of life. Uh, we have some autonomous zones declared in some cities like uh, Seattle and in Brooklyn. Uh, protesters dig in to massive encampments with increasingly semi-permanent structures. Now some state governors are deploying the National Guard uh, against protesters. Now that Trump is president, he's declared his willingness to sick the army on uh, individual protesters as well, or individual protests. Uh, globally, markets are in turmoil. We're seeing everything from uh, from Europe to Japan. Uh, we're seeing uh, values of stock markets going up and down. Uh, lots of liquidity happening um, in response to an anticipation of what might happen next. Uh, in terms of higher education, uh, a whole series of bills uh, pop up in Congress. One of them is simply to abolish the Department of Education, 
break up its functions and distribute them to other units. Another one is to found an academy like West Point uh, for the Space Force. Another one is to end all federal money going to campuses doing diversity, equity, inclusion, gender ideology work. Uh, so that includes, for example, National Science Foundation grants. More executive orders are coming up. One of them ends all the Biden administration's debt forgiveness plans, which are immediately challenged in court. Another one fed, uh, forbids federal jobs from requiring degrees. Uh, you can get a waiver for this. Uh, so basically, if you want to work in you know, the post office, the Department of Energy, you no longer have to have uh, an associate's or a bachelor's degree. Uh, another executive order prohibits grants from supplying from supporting any climate work at all. Uh, climate mitigation, climate adaptation, climate research. Uh, another executive order suspends any federal funding to campuses that have significant Gaza encampments. Now, again, this is also immediately decried by universities. Uh, other executive actions, uh, other executive orders, one of them ends federal support for any educational programs and schools teaching DEI or gender ideology. Again, this is one that's going to go straight to the courts. And another is to launch a program that looks at universities for undue Chinese influence, quote unquote. Uh, so looking for ways in which universities uh, are charged with assisting the Chinese government or Chinese companies or Chinese military in research and development. Now, academic responses continue to develop and continue to expand. I mentioned before, we had protests in camps. We now have some of those occurring on campuses that are very persistent. We have some academics individual academics uh, claim they will not cooperate with the new administration. So we have some heads of IT who said that they will they would be inclined to resist any requests for data about undocumented students, for example. We have, pro we have professors who say that they will continue their work on whatever the topic is, and despite the new administration. We've had several campus leaders, including a chancellor of one system, vow that they will not comply with Trump administration uh, orders. Two of them or swiftly fired, one by their state government and one by their board. Some of them have retained. Now, we have some questions that have come in, uh, and I want to uh, put one of them up right away. And this is from uh, our friend Chris Jones in New Hampshire. Uh, and he says, as an adjunct at Southern New Hampshire University, I facilitated a capstone class on citizen responsibility for social change. My students are primarily non-traditional ex-military mid-career. Is DEI dead? That is a great question. Uh, the Trump administration would prefer to have that so. That Trump 2.0 believes, as Governor DeSantis did in Florida, this is where woke comes to die. Uh, and so they would like to have that quashed. Now, the interesting question is, how can academics continue DEI work in the face of Trump 2.0? I'm going to leave that as a question for folks to wrestle with. I, I think oh, something ahead. to consider with DEI especially is um, if you look at the history of U.S. government or any government, uh, generally speaking, governments re uh, fail when they try to legislate culture. Uh, and the real question around DEI is not what kind of official sanction it is or what the question, what even it, what it's called or any of that stuff. It's the question whether those underlying currents that pushed it to the top in the first place, some of which I attribute to our communication technologies today. I mean, I think the Internet is a big reason why we have mm -hmm. DEI, Black Lives Matter, LGBTQ+, because mm -hmm. these voices are heard now in a way that they weren't heard when Walter Cronkite was our sole source of information. So um, the question there is we've seen a lot of efforts in states that have anti-DEI legislation, including my own, um, to do it in a way that it's not called DEI, in a sense. Uh, they continue to support students in any way that they can. There are different kinds of ways to, you know, I think equity or equality, as long as you don't associate it with the hot button uh, uh, versions of, you know, that the, the, that the legislatures, legislators like to bring up, you, you can slide things under the radar a lot. And I think the question really is in any given culture around the, and I think the answer to this question is different in different parts of the country. Yes. Um, and I think that the, you know, the places where there are, there are small islands of culture, so to speak of this kind of culture are going to have the most difficulty, but in other places, I think, and like the question I answered Diet about the uh, climate change, 
there are pla- there are places where this will continue because it is baked into the culture in certain parts of the country, and that will push it forward. So this is um, this is so yeah. important. So this is so important, Tom. I mean, one of the reasons why I wanted to have this be a participatory event, yeah. and why I think it's working so far, is that we're getting all these different voices from literally across the country, from New Mexico, yeah. from New Hampshire, from Texas, from California, from Michigan. Uh, and it may be that the, the country divides and could, or continues to divide ever more, mm-hmm. like we saw with, uh, for example, with abortion um, rights after uh, the Dobbs decision, where some mm-hmm. states pushed very hard for restrictions and some states right. pushed hard for support. Um, and a, a second thing uh, to point out about this uh, that is that is so key, I think, is the role of the internet in uh, expressing and supporting all this discussion. There's a whole bunch of stuff in the chat. I want to I want to grab onto these. And again, mm-hmm. friends, please feel free to use the uh, Q and A box, or if you want to join us on stage. Um, then just click the raised hand button. Uh, Greg Shunkman asks a very, very precise question. I love the practicality of this. Are there still supply chain issues with antidepressants and anxiety medications? Yes, and there are signs they may worsen, Greg, uh, because we haven't talked about this, but Trump would like to have new tariffs. And so that is causing a lot of suppliers to be anxious about you know, how they're going to be able to afford to do this. So there's talk of prices going up, which, of course, you know, threatens the supply chain. Uh, Michael uh, Welker says, our personal leadings are almost irrelevant as significant civil unrest or wild policy swings will challenge all of us to maintain continuity and integrity of academic experience. This is really true, Michael. Um, so think about you know, how many of these campuses might switch, for example, to online uh, classes if they feel that the face-to-face experience is too fraught or too dangerous. Uh, how many people will think, all right, I disagree with this election, but I want to make sure that my beloved institution continues to do the work that I think is so precious. That's a great, great point, Michael. Um, Shelby uh, uh, has a, a kind of, I think, tongue-in-cheek observation, but this is a really serious one to think about. Pivots, doing pivoting is draining. Uh, so for a lot of academics, we're going to feel a lot of exhaustion, not just fury and, and despair and upset, but also uh, exhaustion from this. Um, the uh, Stephanie P um, asked, do you think they'll start looking at people here on visas or with green cards since those can be easily tracked? Yes, I think that will happen pretty quickly, although the deporting is aimed more of those who are completely undocumented. Um, Greg Shuckman says that he's a registered federal lobbyist for public university, so this isn't exactly an academic exercise for me. Quite true, Greg. This is a very serious one, I think, for almost all of us um, in great detail. Uh, we might talk about this in a lighthearted way. Um, I think partly that's when gra- one of the classic human ways of grappling with a very, very challenging situation. Um, uh, Daita Sergei uh, points out something that hits her very directly. And Greg, this is an example of what you're talking about. Uh, she says she might no longer have a job because the organization that she works with, uh, AISHI, uh, they work with campuses to help their sustainability uh, efforts. Uh, she might not have a job after this. Is she even employable? So think about all of those of us who work on climate issues. What happens to your employability? Uh, Greg Shuckman says, comes back to one of the points, Space Force Academy actually has bipartisan support. It's not a bad idea. You know, we have academies for different branches of the military, for the Marines, for the Air Force, for the Navy, uh, Coast Guard. So that would follow suit. Um, you know, Lisa says, other than laughter, what is the international reaction to all of this? Um, so far, uh, markets are still really uh, fluid and dynamic. People aren't sure where to go. Uh, a bunch of Trump administration 1.0 uh, uh, connections have called to express their support. So, for example, the president of Hungary, presidents of Russia, of North Korea, for example. Uh, European uh, responses are very muted but very tactful, often on a formal level, but quite a bit of, uh, of upset from people, especially in European academia. Um, Christopher asks, have any of these executive orders explicitly referenced curriculum prescriptions or prescriptions? Thank you for phrasing it like that. Um, Right now, yes. Uh, The executive orders against um, uh, DEI, and here, let me bring this back, uh, gender ideology, again, quote unquote, um, and also um, for um, any grants supporting climate work. So that includes quite a few academic institutions running with that. Uh, Greg adds that looking at university collections to connections to China are already underway in the Department of Defense, but there are lawmakers who want to expand that. Uh, quite true. One of the House committees led by Republicans just issued a major report 
uh, Dunning, all kinds of universities for supporting China in different ways. We also saw a um, arrest of four students recently graduated from the University of Michigan for taking photos of a state of Michigan uh, military installation. Uh, in the chat, we have questions from uh, another question from Chris Jones. And let me bring this one up here. Uh, thank you, Chris, for this. Um, there is already a Republican pushback to spending and tax cut proposals, even though Republicans will there be divided government in terms of policy? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, so far, it looks like a unitary government in a few ways. We have uh, Republican majorities in the House and Senate. We have Republican White House. Uh, and also we have the honeymoon period, you know, the initial uh, days after the installation of the new administration, uh, the famous 100 days period for some, uh, where they try and get that done. Uh, now, will there be dissension within the ranks? Uh, so far, um, uh, Trump has worked very hard against that, but it's possible uh, that we could see more splits begin to occur. Um, uh, Shelby, if you want to say more about your experience with uh, with Florida, because uh, obviously DeSantis and Governor DeSantis and President Trump are very <laughs> different people, but they um, but um, there's quite a bit of uh, of uh, trial um, that has gone on under DeSantis to really try to corral and influence higher education. If you want to share anything about this, uh, I'd, I'd really appreciate that. Um, uh, Michael L. Wilker says, just connect the dots that my anniversary vacation will be in late November. Traveling through multiple states will be interesting either way. Indeed, Michael. Now, what a road trip. Uh, if you're going to be by, by train or by car, you'll get a chance to uh, see a great deal. Um, let's see. We have uh, more questions and more comments. Uh, Seth says, I suspect the great sorting of the left leaning to the coast and right leaning to the south and center Longer term consequences, scary, you're a Californian. Uh, yeah, it seems that people who can't leave uh, their, uh, the nation for whatever reason or decide not to, uh, moving to areas of, uh, that are more politically congenial. Uh, so you know, more conservatives moving to you know, Florida, Alabama, Idaho, more progressives moving to New York. Uh, not as much in California, as you know, California's population has declined for a couple of years as people are, are starting to have a uh, net moving out. Um, but that great sifting uh, seems likely to continue. Um, John Henry, uh, the uh, the we are right now in the second part of this scenario. Um, I have a question to ask along those lines uh, before we move. Um, Lisa asks, would this actually open up faculty, online faculty jobs? Uh, and that's quite possible. We might see hiring um, such examples of, of uh, Institutions like the New College of Florida, where either faculty are fired or leave, uh, there's opportunity to hire more people. Um, Lisa asked if it's possible some red states will leave the United States. Uh, I wouldn't see that happening right now at this moment in the scenario because their their political allies are triumphant at the national level. I would think at this point the blue states would be the ones leaving the Republic of Cascadia. <laughs> yes, yes. That will be something that will be talked about, that people will want to say, all right, or just looking at California, you know, and the usual arguments are, you know, California is the, you know, I believe the richest state in the United States. It would be the, what, the third, fourth largest economy in the world, if you look at it by itself, um, you know, the, the time to it exit. Would, it wouldn't stay that way. I mean, if you think Brexit was bad yeah. for the UK, oh, I, any I, U.S. state that actually tried to secede at some level would be catastrophic for that for the state that would do it yeah. Yeah. Um, from an economic perspective. I mean, Brexit's a good model for this, I think. Yeah, Bre yeah Brexit is, this This would be Brexit on steroids because- This won't, uh, this won't stop people from uh, talking about it or perhaps trying to, or legislators from uh, positioning bills for this. Uh, Catherine Furlong says, the Oberlin group of liberal arts college libraries meeting last week, we were talking about diversity audits and our facilitators from a public university in South Carolina. She referenced changing the words to describe the work. Uh, I've been seeing a lot of that across the U.S., Catherine, uh, people talking about belonging instead of diversity and inclusion, for example. So we might see more of that uh, or other terms that come up in order to continue to do this kind of work. Uh, speaking of this, of this work, we're, we're at our last five minutes of time. Um, can, can I just put out a call for your last questions and observations about this? Can I make a quick observation about federalism? And that uh, is very, that... Very quickly. 
Yeah, very quick. I know. Um, the um, you know, one of the things the Republicans did do in certain areas, they're not consistent about this, but with with, you know, with the uh, uh, abortion question, for instance, you know, they 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 push that lo- that decision making down to the states. Well, that cuts both ways. And the states might feel, uh, you know, it's it's and a lot of federal power, a lot of U.S. federal power is based on throwing federal money at state level problems. Mm-hmm. And so uh, uh, that only works because they're basically being paid to, you know, and that same thing goes for universities and so on. And that's important that if the states decide to take over that funding, that federal power is diminished. Uh, and um, the actual formal powers that the, the US federal government has over domestic policy are actually quite limited in the Constitution. So um, we've just had the system that's built up over these years since, when, since we've had the administrative state for the last century where the federal government's had all this money because of the income tax that has been able to control what the states are doing through funding. You know, how did we raise the drinking age to 21 everywhere? We cut highway funding for those states that didn't do it. Right. So this kind of works in reverse, too, though. But then the states have to step up and fund these things. And the states are always screaming poverty. But maybe we need to rethink that. That's a really, really good point. Don. Uh, that's a wow. Um, that's a really, really deep insight. As usual, you, you always do this in the forum. You have these <laughs> very penetrating insights in that. Uh, I, I'd like to. Um, ask all of you uh, a couple of quick logistical questions. Then I want to ask you to reflect a bit on on this experience. Uh, uh, First of all, um, would you mind, those of you who have been using the chat, uh, would you mind if uh, I uh, use your chat in a blog post, just digest it and and paste it by anonymizing you? Uh, Chris Jones, do you mind if I include uh, your questions? Uh, I can anonymize you as well, if you course. Uh, Lisa Daisy, say yes. Uh, Arthur, or sorry, Amber points out uh, she can see travel trade restrictions being the greatest universal in- hindrance. Uh, you definitely see this. Imagine it might be difficult to buy, say, uh, Vermont maple syrup in uh, Georgia. Um, a second question, or just a practical question to ask you all, is this scenario was premised on the idea of Trump winning the election. Would you like next week to run the opposite version of this exercise where Harris wins? Uh, if you could just please let me know in the chat. We should have time to build that out. Uh, see some enthusiastic, yes, wow, okay, okay. Um, I'll take that as a uniform yes. Then let me ask you to step back from what we just have just done for the last uh, 49, 59 minutes. What did you think of this experience? What did you learn from this? What can you take away from it? Besides wanting to have a perpetual Brian and Tom show as a as a regular program, <laughs> careful what you wish for. Next week, I'm only here for the last third of the the session because I have conflict again next week. Understood. <laughs> uh, Lisa talked about this in terms of civil war, and that is one of the options that some of us have been uh, thinking about very carefully. Mm. Uh, Daisy, I'll definitely try and make it uh, as fair as possible. Chris, I'm, I'm sorry to add to your anxiety. I, I, I did warn everybody. Um, John Henry, um, more chaotic. Exactly. Uh, exactly. That's that's where we're headed for this. I, I would be real quite careful about saying civil war is coming. I, I think the, the, the population is too... It, it's, it's a completely different world than in 1860 as far as the oh. intertwingling of the population across the country. And, you know, there were pockets of unionist support in the south and pockets of confederate support in the north uh but nothing like you know atlanta in georgia is yeah. today or or houston in texas or austin in texas it, it, and we didn't have that kind of information space either so i, I just don't i don't civil see it uh, civil unrest yes civil war that's eh, i just don't see that happening okay thank you thank you tom that's a really good caution um John Henry asks us to keep in mind the chaos and the aftermath. Uh, Seth uh, says that it's very helpful in terms of broadening my thinking about all these things that could go wrong. What I was hoping for from this session. Thank you. Thank you, Seth. I'm glad to hear it. Uh, increased hope, says Michael Walker, from the quiet majority of nonpartisans who just want things to keep working. Yeah, I mentioned that before. Mm-hmm. Um, Dieta says it's worse than I thought. So, Dieta, it's the 
part of the professional responsibility of futurists. We have to be open to all these possibilities. And your work that you do is very, very important. Um, Shelby says uh, that they missed the golden age of 2012. Like, <laughs> we we're only worried the Mayan apocalypse would come true. Well, let's, uh, let's see what we can do. Um, uh, Amber points out crisis planning is a required skill set in higher education now. Yes, and that's the spirit of this exercise. Um, uh, Chris Jones points out civil disruption is very possible. Uh, Stephanie says that they appreciate uh, concerns for the, uh, to be aware of and this helps us prepare. Uh, I'm so glad. Uh, I'm so glad. Uh, friends, we have to wrap up. Um, we have to uh, um, start looking uh, at uh, our next week because uh, we are out of time. Um, this passed by for me, I think, in an incredible speed. Um, and I, I want to thank everybody uh, for, um, for putting all this, all this thought together. Tom, I want to especially thank you for being on stage with me, giving us the benefit of your expertise as well as your good sense of humor and your deep thought. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just looking ahead, if you, want to, if you want to keep talking about this, uh, we have, um, of course, all the options on the socials, as they say. Uh, so you could uh, tweet about this, share it on Mastodon, uh, as I think Lisa threatened to do, uh, LinkedIn, Threads, Blue Sky, and, of course, my blog, where I will hopefully have a recording this up. If you want to look at our previous session, including our handful of previous exercises like this, just go to tinyurl.com slash archive. Uh, looking ahead, we have sessions coming up on a wide range of topics, including enrollment, uh, the right to learn, reform and grading, educability, the future of libraries. Just go to the Future Transform website, form.futureofeducation.us to learn more. Uh, once again, thank you for contributing and making all of this work. This is a great discussion. I appreciate all of you doing that. I hope everyone takes care. Those who have traveled, please travel safely. And everybody, be safe and well. We'll see you next time online. Bye-bye. <laughs>